So the next speaker is uh, Sharon. Yeah, from uh, Gladstone Institute. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon Juzinski. I'm a uh, PhD candidate at UC San Francisco in the Gladstone Institute's and Katie Pollard's lab, and I'm uh, excited to tell you about work from our recent preprint titled uh, Deep Learning Prediction of Gene Expression from Personal Genomes. So genetic variants, um, especially genetic variants that are in non-coding parts of the genome, can contribute to changes in gene expression and therefore contribute to complex traits in human disease. Uh, so there is like a ton of active interest in research in identifying variants and figuring out which ones are functional and the mechanism by which uh, they function, as we all know. Uh, one research direction that's been talked about a lot is to train models that take DNA sequences input and nothing else and uh, try to predict gene expression. Now, since we know that there is a relationship between sequence and expression, the hope is that if the model is able to accurately learn that relationship, then we can interrogate the model, figure out what it has learned. Um, for example, just two that are relevant to this talk, we could feed it someone's personal DNA sequences to predict their expression levels of specific genes, or we could predict the effects of specific variants um, and try to use the model to generate hypotheses about the mechanisms by which they function. Um, as has been talked about a lot, there are existing models that have been trained to do this already. These are typically CNNs, um, including Informer, which has a convolutional transformer architecture and will be a focus of this talk. These models are, um, they have like a ton of really impressive properties, but one thing that they don't do very well uh, is explain gene expression variability. Um, what I mean by that, this uh, might remind you of the keynote earlier today, uh, is that in a pair of papers that were out last year in Nature Genetics, the authors used cohorts of people that have had their whole genome sequenced and gene expression values measured and uh, used them to test the ability of these models to predict gene expression given DNA sequences that contain variants seen in these people. Um, that leads to something that looks like this, where each point here represents a different person. The x-axis is that person's observed expression, in this case, of the gene COL5A3. Um, and the y-axis is their predicted expression, given their DNA sequence, in this case from the model informer. Um, and here, the story is that the correlation here is low. And since informer only takes DNA sequences input, and the only difference between the DNA sequences that come from these different people are the variants that they contain, um, that suggests that, uh, the low correlation suggests that the model isn't able to pick up on those variants and figure out who should have relatively higher or lower expression for this gene. So for this gene, informer um, doesn't do a very good job at explaining variability in gene expression across people. Um, and that's not because there aren't genetic variants around this gene that are important for its expression. And here's an example to illustrate that point. I'm using, um, this is an elastic net, very similar to the PredictScan, like linear model that Nyla was talking about um, in her keynote. Um, it predicts gene expression using people's genotype. And it can find genetic variants and pretty accurately predict who should have relatively higher or lower expression for this gene using those genotypes, even while Informer cannot. So um, Informer is basically underperforming expectations here. Um, and again, that suggests that for this gene, Informer isn't doing a good job at figuring out which variants seen in the DNA sequences of these people contribute to gene expression changes. Um, this was first reported by Sase et al. and Huang et al. last year, where they showed um, that other sequence to expression deep learning models, not just Informer, underperform these simple linear models on most genes. Um, so this is an important challenge that we need to resolve, and it's not limited to just Informer. Um, and I think given this result, it's interesting to consider how these models were trained in the first place, and that is by taking DNA sequences that come from the reference genome and optimizing on the results that come from various assays, including gene expression assays that were measured in cells and tissues um, that do not have the reference genome. Uh, and this has led to state-of-the-art models, the scheme, and these models have, again, really impressive properties, but I've also wondered whether this could be limiting model accuracy. Um, and that's because, in a way, the model is kind of trying to learn a relationship that doesn't completely exist. Uh, these cells do not have the reference genome, yet it's trying to learn that relationship between the reference genome and gene expression. But maybe more importantly, it means that such a model will never have had any opportunity to see any genetic variant at any point uh, during training at any locus. Um, and that might partially explain why they underperform when they're asked to predict gene expression from sequences that contain genetic variants. Um, and so, given this, we wanted to evaluate whether fine-tuning with personal genomes will basically improve their ability to predict uh, gene expression from people. 
Um, and so to that end, we use data from the GTEx consortium uh, where uh, there's paired whole genome sequences and gene expression values that come from the same people. We focused on data that come from whole blood for which we have uh, 670 people uh, that have with whole genome sequenced um, and gene expression values measured. We use this data set to fine tune Informer, starting with its pre-trained weights, and each batch consists of the DNA sequences that come from different people of length 49 kilobases, um, and the targets are scalar gene expression values that are matched to the same people. I also want to point out, um, you know, the, the linear models that I mentioned earlier, which outperform existing deep learning models, are fit in a manner that is very, very similar to this. The main difference is that instead of sequence, they're just fit on some kind of genotype matrix uh, that contains the counts of different observed SNPs that are seen in those people. Um, I also want to point out that when we do this, there are two different things that we can hold out, which is genes and people. So when we're training, we use people from the train set, genes from the train set. But when we evaluate on held out people only, uh, and you might see the acronym HOP uh, floating around in this talk, we are using unseen people from the test set, uh, but the same genes from the train set. And so that means that when we're evaluating on held out people, uh, we're evaluating in a part of the genome that the model has seen, either during pre-training or fine tuning. So it may already have an idea of what regulatory elements are important for the expression of this gene. Um, and it can also rely on variants that it saw during training, especially EQTLs that might also be seen in people from the test set. But I want to point out that this is exactly how linear models um, that currently outperform deep learning models are trained and evaluated. Um, holding out people and genes is much harder. And to do well on this task, the model needs to be able to accurately predict the effects of variants in parts of the genome that it hasn't seen. So in the next few slides, I'm going to focus on evaluations first in held out people because, like I said, this is the same scheme that is used to fit and evaluate linear models that currently beat uh, existing sequence to expression deep learning models. And I explore this evaluation first to understand whether deep learning models are even capable of competing uh, with linear models on this task. And then I'm going to return to the more ambitious question of held out people and genes at the end of the talk. Um, and so here's an example of what things look like after fine tuning on personal genomes. Uh, each point here, again, is a different person. Um, the x-axis represents their observed expression, in this case for the gene BTNL3, and the y-axis is their predicted expression. Um, for this gene, with Informer before fine-tuning, in green here, um, Informer is not very good at predicting for this gene which variants should have relatively higher or lower expression. That's reflected by the low correlation. In elastic net, uh, fit on the same gene, does a lot better. And after fine-tuning Informer, and we call this new model uh, that was fine-tuned on personal genomes, Performer, um, its accuracy becomes competitive with the linear models. Um, and this trend sticks if we evaluate on other genes, again, only in held out people. Now here, each row is a different gene, and the x-axis value is the correlation taken across people that I've shown on the previous slides. Um, the story here is that Performer in blue and elastic nets uh, in red uh, typically do similar for these genes, while Informer sometimes um, underperforms. So fine-tuning um, on Informer helps us become competitive with linear models, but one thing that I also want to point out is that we don't reliably do better than the linear models after fine-tuning on personal genomes either. They're roughly on par. Um, and we've tried training and evaluating on up to 300 genes and find that this trend holds um, basically over those genes. So overall, Fine-tuning on personal genomes um, seems to improve the ability of Informer to overcome some of those previously documented issues uh, and better explain expression variability across people. So although Performer gets similar accuracy to elastic net models, one reason why we might still want to use a model, a sequence to expression model like Performer anyways, is if it does a better job at finding functional variants. Um, and so to look into that, we took variants that were predicted by each model to cause large changes to gene expression. For Informer and Performer, that just meant simple in silico mutagenesis experiments where you take two sequences that are otherwise identical but differ by the variant, form a prediction with each, and take the difference. That difference represents the predicted change due to the variant. Um, and for elastic net models, we use the learned coefficients for each SNP. And moving forward, I'm just going to call these variant weights for simplicity. Um, and here is one example. I'm showing a uh, one kilobase region around the gene ZFP57. The, the position is along the x-axis. Um, and I'm showing the variant weights along the y-axis. 
And I want to bring your attention to this variant that's inside of this dashed box here. This is a rare variant that wasn't seen by any of these models during training, yet performer uh, seems to upweight it. Um, the reference allele for this SNP is a C, and the alternate allele is a G. And we use software called Motif Breaker to see whether this SNP is expected to change uh, transcription factor binding. This is based on experimental PWM data, not like model gradients or something like that. Um, and we found that the C to G change is associated uh, or is expected to increase affinity for the binding of these two transcription factors to DNA. Um, so th this is just an example of how even though elastic nets and performer might get similar correlations across people, performer might still be relying on variants that maybe have more evidence of uh, functionality. Here's another example. I'm still looking at the same gene, CFP57. Um, it's just a different variant this time. It's a common one. The story here is similar, though, where the alternate allele is a C, um, and it's expected to increase affinity for the binding of certain transcription factors to DNA. But it's not included in the elastic net model. So over many genes and many variants, we see that uh, variants that have large weights from informer and performer are expected to alter motifs at roughly the same rates, uh, and that's what I'm showing on the x-axis. Um, this maybe suggests that performer isn't just relying on sort of arbitrary EQTLs in the training data, but it's still paying more attention to EQTLs and other variants that alter expression by disrupting important motifs even after fine-tuning. Um, and second, variants with high weights that come from performer alter motifs at a greater rate than those that come from elastic net, the linear models, even though the correlations that they both get across people are very similar. Um, one way that this could be possible is if the variants that are upweighted by elastic net models and performer models are in LD with each other, um, but the performer variants maybe are still more functional more often. So, so this, I guess, might be a reason why we might want to use a model like performer over linear models, even though the accuracy that they see across people is pretty comparable. Now, I want to close on the much harder task of evaluating um, these models on held out people and held out genes. Um, I think you know, strong performance on this task maybe obviously is more difficult because the model can only really do well here um, by using information that it's learned from other parts of the genome. Uh, and it doesn't already have an idea of how different motifs and variants that are seen around this gene contribute to gene expression changes. Yet we expect a model that has like comprehensively learned causal gene regulatory patterns to be able to do well on this anyways. Um, so if I fine tune informer with genes in informer's original train set, but I hold out 100 genes, this is the distribution of those correlation scores that I see for those genes. Each one of these dots is a different unseen gene from the test set. The y-axis is the correlation across people we find for each of those unseen genes. If instead of holding out those genes, I trained on them directly, this gives us a baseline for the accuracy that we should expect to see for those genes. Um, and we see that relative to when we hold the genes out, or I should say, uh, relative to when we train on them directly, when we do hold uh, them out, we underperform relative to this baseline. Um, so that suggests that when we hold genes out, basically, the model doesn't do as good of a job at identifying important variants in those DNA sequences um, uh, that contribute to gene expression changes. It's also, by the way, not any better than informer's accuracy on these genes originally. So fine-tuning on personal genomes doesn't lead to better performance on held-out genes relative to the original pre-trained model. Um, in my view, what I'm sort of showing here, this story, is, is, is an important gap uh, because we expect models that have learned causal gene regulatory patterns, causal relationships between sequence and expression to do well here, um, but they don't yet. So there are still uh, important remaining challenges, even after fine-tuning existing models with additional personal genome data. Um, so I want to point out that uh, we've been in communication with folks from the Ioannidis and Mustafavi labs and have found that our results are mostly consistent with what they have found when fine-tuning models or training models with personal genome data or genetic variation data. And so in this talk, I focused a little bit less on the model choices and architectural choices that we made um, because all of our groups have made different choices and our results seem to be pretty robust against those choices. Um, I've shown that we can overcome some previously documented issues of explaining expression variability if we fine tune on personal genomes. We call the resulting model performer, um, and it does similarly well, but not reliably better than linear models. Um, uh, but maybe the variants that it selects have more evidence of functionality. And that maybe represents the promise of using like a sequence to expression model as opposed to a linear model for, for this kind of stuff. And uh, while we overcome that previous gap, 
uh, we identify a new gap, which is uh, performance on held out people and genes, um, and more work is needed there. So altogether, we think fine tuning on personal genomes um, is a step in the right direction. It corrects some previously documented issues, um, but there are other issues that remain. Uh, so yeah, thank you. I would like to first actually acknowledge uh, folks from my lab, especially my advisor, Katie, and uh, the co-first author on my paper, Sean, as well as folks from the UNEDs, Mustafavi, Troinskaya, and Capra Labs for helpful discussions, and uh, my funding sources. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, beautiful talk. Um, the publicly available data sets for which we don't have any uh, genotypes and the data sets where we have matched genotypes and some RNA-seq, for example, there will always be this kind of gap. So the ideal model should, I think, take the advantage of both of these kind of data sources, right? Because the biology coverage of the data sets without genotypes will always have kind of lar larger coverage than this like tiny subset of it where we have access to genotypes too. So what do you think about like reconciling like these two and maybe yeah. using genotypes whenever available, but defaulting back to like reference genome when it's yeah. not? I think using the genotypes is helpful, but clearly it doesn't like get us to exactly what we want. And I think using the data sets that don't have genotypes is still helpful, especially for pre-training. I don't think that if we didn't start with like a pre-trained model that came from those types of data sets that we would be able to identify variants with more evidence of functionality. Because then what we're left with is a model that more or less is relying on learning the same kind of associations that a linear model learns, right? And um, I guess it's unclear if we would have enough data to learn anything more than that, even if we have a more complex model, if that makes sense. Another quick question. Uh, how, how much do you think Informer forgets about the, the regulator code that it learns in the pre-training when you fine-tune it on individual genome? Yeah, that's something that we're still looking into. It's, it's unclear. There are some things that it doesn't do as well on, like it doesn't predict the average expression of unseen genes as well as before, but part of that is because of the way that we're sort of normalizing the data to be distributed kind of around zero um, and normally and appear normal. Um, We've also seen examples where the motifs that it picks up around the genes that it's seen and around genes that it hasn't seen are different from the ones that Informer picked up on, but they still look like real motifs that align to PWMs that we see in like Hokomoko databases, for example. So it's unclear if it's really like forgetting something, but it, it seems to be learning something a little bit different as well, but we need to explore that more. Thanks for a really nice talk. I thought the result on like variant weights, I think that's what you call them, compares them with PredictScan, and that was, kind of promising, but I wonder, so for um, defining the variant weights for a predict scan, I guess you just run elastic net on the same set of training individuals and take the weight from that. Um, so it could be a little bit unstable, and I wonder if you've tried like ensembling elastic yeah. net model and averaging the weights, and like is that still worse oh. than your model's weights in some way? Like I just wanna know how big the gap is to understand how much mechanism that your model did really Yeah, we, we haven't tried that. We, the, all the results that I've shown do come from um, different replicates of both the performer models and the elastic net models, but when it comes to the results that um, come from the variant weights, we didn't try averaging the weights that come from different model replicates and comparing averages versus averages. We just took the first fold and compared them to each other, but that's an interesting thing to try. But the, the correlations across people are all averages across different model replicates. Hey, thanks for another great talk. Um, the other thing I was struck by is that you have the same results as, uh, for instance, Nyla presented in whole blood that she had in brain, right? Does that suggest something interesting about whether these models of cell, you know, cell type specific expression, uh, like we saw in the previous talk, would would be helpful? I think if we had, if I understand your question, if we had like cell, we we don't have. Um, data where there's matched whole genome sequences and gene expression values where the gene expression are like single cell resolution, at least with many people. If we had that type of data, I think it would be better because, you know, maybe we would be able to identify genetic variants that cause changes to gene expression in rare cell types that you wouldn't be able to resolve in the bulk level data. Um, but that might be wishful thinking, so. I mean, for common variants, you may be able to find that in cancer databases. Yeah, that's an interesting place to look. Thank you. Great, thank you for the nice talk. 